Um, I wanted to say uh, thank you to our sponsors again, our premier sponsors, TE Connectivity and ADRF, our uh, gold sponsors, Axle Wireless, Comscope, IB Wave, BTI Wireless, Expo, and Corning Mobile Access. Um, we've got a, a good uh, session again today. I think it'll be a good day. Um, uh, I want you to know that um, if you are looking for bios, they are on our website. And also the slides will be made available to attendees afterwards. I'll be sending you an email um, that will have that in it, as well as a short survey. And there's a chance for you guys to give back what you did like about the show, what you'd like to see about the show next time, where you'd like the show to be. It, it's a place for you to uh, send your commentary to us. And so uh, please uh, do that. So uh, welcome to our breakfast morning keynote. Um, it is sponsored by Goodman Networks for more than a dozen years. Goodman has been a trusted partner to wireless network operators and OEMs, helping them respond to rapid technological advances and meet subscriber expectations. Its end-to-end -end DAS solutions help its customers improve coverage and capacity at enterprise facilities, shopping centers, hotels, convention centers, hospitals, and stadiums. Um, our keynote speaker for this morning is Chad Towns. Chad is the vice president of the Antenna Solutions Group at AT&T. Uh, he is responsible for the end-to-end uh, deployment of AT&T wireless infrastructure delivered via DAS. This includes the sales, RF engineering, design, and construction of both in-building and outdoor DAS applications throughout AT&T's network in 50 states and Puerto Rico, as well as the leasing of the AT&T tower assets. So please join me in welcoming Chad Towns. Who thinks more is better than less? Okay, why? More is better than less because if stuff is not less, if there's more less stuff, then you might you might want to have some more, and your parents just don't let you because there's only a little. Bit. Right. We want more. We want more. Like you really like it. You right. want more. I follow you. It's not complicated. More is better, and AT and T has the nation's largest 4G network. Just a shameless plug for AT&T. That is what I feel like every single day in the DAS business. Except in my world, sitting around that table, it's my boss. I want more. You can't have money. I want more. It's the venue owners. I want more. Where are you? When are you going to build my building? I want more. It's the vendors. I want more. When are you going to spend more money with you? I want more. So that is my world every day. So <laughs> figured it was a good kickoff. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of what does a neutral host DAS really need to look like, and how do we do it from AT&T's perspective. So I'm not saying it's right, I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm just going to talk about how we go about it, and really dispel the myth that we're out there building networks for ourselves. We're really out there building networks as a neutral host provider. We want to make sure that what we build, everybody has access to, because ultimately that means I spend less money on DAS networks, and that's what it's all about from our perspective. How do we get our customers better service and reduce the cost on how we do it? So with that, I'll dive right in. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about all these in more detail, but really from our perspective, these are the things that we look at before we do anything. Before we decide, I'm definitely going to go build this venue, we say, if I build it, what do I need to consider? How much is it going to cost and what do I need to do? Obviously, the size of the venue and how many people are going to be there is a major factor in it. But we also look at demand in that particular market. What's smartphone penetration? How many people there are using devices? What carriers are there and what are the market share of the different carriers? If another carrier has a bigger market share than me, do I need to build my DAS bigger to support them, or do I just need to care for my own needs? That's an important factor in this. Spectrum position is a really big factor for us. If I have a really deep spectrum position, I might not need a very big DAS, but one of our competitors that might want to join that DAS might have a shallow spectrum position and therefore might need more services, bigger sectorization. So we've got to account for all that. So the biggest player in the market isn't always the one with the greatest amount of need. The DAS has to service that. Future tenants, we always try to make sure who do we think is going to join the system and we care for that up front, not on a reactionary basis when they come knocking. That's a big deal. We'll talk about more. And then finally, the sectorization plan. Um, I hear it all the time. AT&T, your networks are too big. They're too expensive. Why do you build the sector counts that you do? And it's because we have a quality of service we want to deliver, but we're also planning for the future and making sure that we meet it. And then lastly, this picture on the right is the New Orleans Superdome, which is you know, obviously just down the street. 
And we're going to talk about how we deployed there and what that means and kind of how we went about making that happen so we can get a real in-depth view of how we deploy our networks there. First and foremost, we always talk about space. This is a real important factor when you're placing your gear. How do you account for space? When we go deploy, we don't just get space for AT&T and say, let's not worry about the other carriers. It's their problem when they come. We actually reserve space in the systems so that we can care for them when we can. Venue owners don't always let it happen, but when we can, we always reserve the space and get it up front. Now, we might not always pay for it up front, but we make sure that the space is available for the other carriers when they come next to the head end, so we're not having to do a lot of uh, ad hoc cabling and whatnot to drive cost up for the other providers. So one of the things that we always account for, this is the actual blueprints, I believe, I can't remember where this, which deployment this was, but you'll see if you were able to look real close, we've actually mapped out how much space we think T-Mobile would need, Verizon would need, Sprint would need, as well as AT&T to account for that particular venue. So we try to build that into the plan right up front. The next one is power, uh, making sure we have enough power to get us and our tenants in, in that um, able to care for. So we don't just build, again, a power plant capable of serving AT&T's needs. We build the power plant that's there to service the other carriers. We're betting on the come that somebody else is going to want to join the system eventually, and we're going to make it happen. In the end, do I spend more money up front on this? Yes. But in the long run, do I save us all a bunch of money? Absolutely. When the second and third carrier come on, the savings by doing it right the first time pays for itself in spades on the back end of the network deployment. The next one I talked about was, uh, was uh, the power of the bands. What spectrum is there? We always deploy in our neutral host systems all the frequency bands that are currently available in the marketplace. We don't say, I'm going to put them in, you know, we're 850 and 1900, so that's all I'm going to do. We deploy all spectrum bands for all carriers so that we're ready to deploy when everybody else is to come on the system. That doesn't mean we, we no longer have to do separate layers, separate cable runs, separate remotes. We're building it is as needed right at the top, right off the bat. This is the way we try to do our systems. We also look at the technology that's out there. Obviously, everything we build now is going to be uh, LTE capable, not just 2G and LTE or in, uh, in 3G. Um, we're starting to not put 2G in a lot of our systems. We're starting to just get away from it because the space and power consumption is not worth what we're going to be deploying down the road. So we're starting to shift gears and just leave it out. The other thing is we struggle with is cost, right? We can't make these things too expensive. So we always look at what's the nature of the building. We aren't always putting MIMO. Uh, in a building. We're doing, sometimes doing SISO in buildings if the demand is low and the building is more from a coverage play. So we not, we're not always building the biggest and baddest. Many times we're going in and looking at what do we need to do to meet the need of that building at the lowest possible cost. So we are taking those things into account. Quality. This is a big, big, big one to us. Uh, we want to make sure that the system gets built and gets built right the first time. Um, you know, if you're one of our install vendors, I'm sure you know this all too well. We are very, very picky. We come back with a huge punch list trying to make sure that quality is king. But what we don't want to have happen is a deployment gets out there and we end up reworking it over and over and over again. We want to make sure it's done right and it works and it doesn't fail when we need it most. So quality is a big, big issue for us. <clears throat> and the, this is the, the one that we struggle with all the time is are we working with the venue to get what we need into the building? Making sure that there's a partnership between us and the venue and we get antennas in the right places so we can create the right sectorization. Aesthetics are important, but they can't rule the design to a point where the service isn't going to work the way that it's supposed to work. Did we get enough power? Did we get enough space for the other providers? Making sure that we have a great relationship with the venue so that we can get the things that we need to be able to support everyone. And that also means getting creative. Uh, this particular picture here, this is St. Louis Bush Stadium. The interesting thing here is we couldn't find enough space inside of the stadium for us. What are we going to do? The stadium did two things that was really great. Number one, they allowed us in their brand new stadium to build some rooms out of brick that looked like the exterior of the stadium, closed off some portions of the stadium to create space for the other carriers. It was just directly across the walkway from where we were, so we were able to create new space. The other thing they did, this particular room here, it had 30-foot ceilings. We put in a graded floor and we double stacked the equipment. They weren't going to let us do that originally, but through all the work with our structural engineers, they allowed us to do that. So we ended up with all of our BTS equipment up above, all of the DAS head-end equipment and power below, and we effectively doubled the size of the space mid-construction. We finally got that approved. So, uh, but again, the venue worked with us and allowed us to do those things that we needed to do. So let's dive into a real-world study here. What did we do? 
<clears throat> the New Orleans Superdome right here. Um, this is actual the pictures of our deployment there. Um, the head end room, 158 feet long, 48 feet wide, and you could not put another piece of gear in there if you wanted to right now. Um, uh, Verizon, Sprint, and T-Mobile are all in the system. We have space directly adjacent to us. And you notice in the picture on the left middle, that's the head end room. It actually sits in the parking garage on the exterior of the stadium, right outside of the stadium underneath. So what the venue did, which was kind of ingenious, is they just blocked off one row of parking along the entire length of the parking garage, and it butts up on the interior wall to the interior of the stadium. So it was easy to penetrate to get into the stadium, but the equipment was actually to the external. They gave up about 45 or 50 parking places to do this, but at the end of the day, it was the right thing to do. It was allowed all the carriers to have their equipment in one particular place. It was a little longer for us to cable in to get where we needed to go, but it put us all in a common location. You can see what happened here. More than 200 sector carriers from our network's perspective, more than 1,000 antennas, more than 70 miles of cable. This was a massive deployment. We spent a little over $12 million for this thing. Um, we'll get into more about how we did it here in a second. But we looked at the future and said, this is a building that doesn't get used five or six times a year. It gets used all the time. Saints football, Tulane football. It, since we've built it, it's hosted a BCS National Championship game, a Final Four, a Women's Final Four, and then this past year's Super Bowl. And performance, green. When we design a network, we want less than 1% of our calls to drop. We designed this to handle that load at a Super Bowl and achieve that. And I'll show you the results of the Super Bowl here in a little bit, and you can see how well we did. The next thing we did is we planned for the unknown. Kind of fitting here, they had a power outage during the Super Bowl, I think you all remember. This is the generator that we put on site when we built the DAS, big enough to handle all the load for us and the other carriers that are on the system. 1,000 kilowatt, didn't have to use it because we also planned ahead and got a dedicated power feed from the power company. So when the power went out, we didn't skip a beat. We didn't lose one second of the network. We did fire the generator to make sure we were ready to go. We had plenty of battery backup to allow for the transition, but we never needed it. Nevertheless, had it happened, it was there and it was ready to go. We also thought this was real important that this particular venue often gets used for health and public safety in the case of an emergency. This is where people came during the hurricanes. We know that this is going to be a venue that gets used for those kinds of things in the future. God forbid something should happen. So we planned ahead. We wanted to be able to run communications for the public safety workers even in the event of a massive power outage across the entire city. So that's kind of the way we plan ahead to try and service those needs. Um, a mapping of the configuration here, you can see where we put our IDF closets, space them throughout. Um, we do DC power everywhere. We do battery backup everywhere, including our remote locations, so you don't have portions of the stadium that go off air with the power outage. The entire system functions flawlessly, whether we have commercial power coming into the building or not. Everything's on AC, DC backup, ready to roll. From a fiber plant perspective, more is better. We ran two fiber runs. We've got 20 Ethernet circuits that power the AT&T equipment coming in here. Obviously, those fiber runs are available to our uh, competitors if they join the DAS and want to use our transport versus their own. But we did build a redundant fiber path out of the dome back to our uh, respective central offices. So there's no transport failures that can happen on this network. Everything's completely redundant from a path and a performance perspective. The challenges you face at the venue, you can see on the picture to the left, that's the exterior of the dome. You can see all the cobblestones are pulled up. That's the walkway that's on the up, up, upper deck around the, uh, the dome. Right underneath that is where all the equipment is for all the different carriers. So we had to literally rip up every one of the cobblestones across that entire side of the stadium, waterproof it, and then put the cobblestones back down and make it look like it did. And we had to do that within two weeks in between two events. So. Massive, massive undertaking, but again, it wasn't good enough to build the network if we have a hurricane or a driving force winds. You can't have water getting down into the equipment to cause a failure, so we took every precaution we needed to to make sure that that water wouldn't get in. Talking about the design, uh, again, here's the dome. You can see on the right-hand side is what we did from a sectorization plan perspective for the, the bowl itself. Every layer of the dome, 100 level, 200 level, and so forth, has dedicated sectors broken around the stadium. Um, on the exterior, the top picture on the left, we did 13 zones on the exterior of the stadium. Wasn't good enough to have a good experience inside. We also had to have a good experience on the outside as people came in. In New Orleans, unique. Very, very big tailgating area. They have Champion Square area, which is the zones 10, 11 uh, through 13 on the right-hand side. You'll have sometimes 20 to 25,000 people out there during a game 
not less, much less the people that are inside the game because it's just part of the culture, the way people view football here. It's an event. We wanted to make sure. Bottom left, that's Champion Square just before kickoff of the Saints um, playoff game against the Lions two years ago. The first game that we were officially on air with the new DAS network. You can imagine that type of crowd in an outdoor environment. The macro network wouldn't have been able to handle it. We ran green through that event. So we appreciate our partners that helped us with that. There were lots of folks that did that. But uh, ran green through that event. There were almost 20,000 people there during the game. Those aren't people that came and then went inside and then you had a lull in the network. Those are people that came and stayed during the game to watch that and stayed afterward and everybody came outside. And then obviously the right, that's uh, just a normal Saints game there. Talk about the Super Bowl numbers here. And uh, sorry, this is a PDF version, so my charts got a little garbled here. Um, during the game, 73,000 phone calls. That doesn't sound very impressive. It's not. It's going down. Way less calls year over year than in the years past inside these venues. The thing that is impressive, 388 gigabytes worth of data traveled through our network during the game. I mean, it's just an impressive amount of data if you think about how much that really is. Um, more than double the amount of traffic from the year before. Um, more than 24 million tweets originated on our network inside of the dome. And that doesn't account for the other carriers that are on our network. That was just the AT&T network, all of those stats. So just think about the massive amounts of traffic that we're traversing through this thing. Um, if you look at the two boxes that are inserted, those were supposed to pop up later. You can see our performance. Accessibility, 99.2% for the day. So during the game, indoor and out, more than 99% of the phone calls that were attempted went through. First try. So the network was built to manage that kind of capacity at that kind of load. If you look at our retainability, 98.8 on the indoor network, 99.2 on the outdoor network. Again, once you were on, you weren't dropping. You were staying on, you were maintaining what you wanted to do. So 73,000 calls, less than 1% dropped. 388 gig, less than 1% of the time did they get dropped off and have to reinitiate a session. Just massive amounts. It was a little bit lower than that during a couple of peak times during the game, but overall, that was the overall experience from kickoff to the end of the game. Remember the blackout? We talked about that. We did not skip a beat during the blackout for our network. During that hour, now it incidentally included the 10 minutes after halftime, which is typically the busiest 10 minutes of the, of the game for us, everybody uploading all their videos of what they shot during the halftime show. Double the amount of text messages from the prior year during the same time period for the busy hour. More than a 200% 2 increase over the prior year. Gig in one hour. I mean, that's just a massive, massive amount of traffic. And we maintained green through there. We maintained less than 1% drops through that time period. So just a massive undertaking. So this is why we're so diligent about what we build, how we build it, and why we build it. It's not that we want to have these bulletproof networks, but we want to have bulletproof networks. We want it to function just like it does day in and day out when our customers use their phone. We don't want there to be a different experience when I'm at a football game versus when I'm at my office versus when I'm at the hospital versus wherever. We want the network to function flawlessly. Our goal is for our customers to have it look like air. You don't worry about it unless it's not there. When I get complaints, I have a hard time with that. When I don't get accolades, that means I did my job right. So that's what we're kind of doing from a neutral host perspective. So with that, I will uh, open it up to any questions that you guys might have about what we do or how we do it. Shy group. Yes. Right. Um, you know, I, I struggled with this. This was a good discussion because the dome is here and it was relevant. But I'll tell you, my perspective on DAS right now is I'm spending a lot more time and effort on in-building than I am stadiums and venues. If I had my choice, I would never build another stadium again. Not because I don't think they're important, but they get used so little and they cost so much and there's not people there. If you were to compare as much traffic as we did here during one day, that kind of traffic flows through high rises in New York and Chicago every single day. And to me, that's where the future is in the DAS builds, is we've got to be able to get in front of where our customers are all day, every day, not where they are in short bursts. This is what gets the attention. This is what people complain about. But the reality is, I would rather have a 5% improvement in every high rise in the city than have this. 
And it costs a lot more to do that if I do every one, but if I do the right ones and I do them over time, and we build them neutral host, and other people build them neutral host, the more you do, that brings the cost down, we join each other's systems, and it grows and grows and grows from there. So I would rather be doing in-building. I would also rather be doing college campuses, and not from an in-building perspective, but from an outside-in perspective. We need more macros on campus. We need to cover the campuses from the outside in and only build in-building where they have capacity issues. Many of the campuses don't want macros and they're forcing us into DAS. I'm gonna resist that a lot. We need to be doing a lot more rooftop, a lot more outside-in approach, and then only putting DAS where it's needed. Um, and then you come in and you fill in with small cell behind it where you have subterranean levels and things where you can't get to. You fill those in, and then you put a DAS in the stadium. You put a DAS in the hospital. You put a DAS in the places where there's a lot of traffic. So my perspective is we need to be doing this where our customers are all the time, not in these types of venues. Luckily, we're almost done with all of these from a professional perspective. A lot of colleges out there, but you know, my perspective again on the colleges is I'll build your stadium after I build your campus because that's what really matters. Just to follow up on what you just said, if, if you had a DAS in the stadium of a campus, wouldn't it be a, a less per node to go ahead and put additional nodes in the um, buildings and whatnot instead of going to small cells and other things like that? So the question is really extra DAS nodes versus a small cell placement. Where is the break even and how those economics look? Well, I don't know the answer to that yet. I mean, our small cell deployments are getting very, very early. But typically, what we're trying to do from a campus environment is do high power rooftop nodes. Now, we don't want to, I said macro, we really don't want them to be macros. I want to build it again, attach it to the head end so that you end up with one set of antennas on the roofs that cover all the different carriers. Everybody can join them and share in the system. Um, and then you only use the small cell to fill in the gaps where you don't have good coverage. So my perspective is, yeah, you're right. I think we should tie them together. Um, and when I look at a two-year plan or a three-year plan for a, for a school, though, it's not do the stadium first and do the campus second. It's the other way around. My goal is to do the campus first and do the stadium second. Now, that may mean that it happens in the same year. Um, we're trying to tie it off of the same system. And in many cases, we might even put one head in to cover them both. Um, but we need to do them. And so yes, I, I don't plan to go do a ton of small cell deployments around campuses. DAS is going to be the more economic way to go, but you're still going to need some small cell in some areas to fill in the gaps because um, we've done this at one campus. We built a DAS in every building on the entire campus. It was not a good thing. Uh, it cost a ton of money. Great coverage there, but it cost a ton of money. And the thought was, if you build it, they will come, our neutral host DAS approach. None of the other carriers have joined that system as good as it is because it just costs too much. We can't economically get them to stomach spending that much money to cover one college. It's just not right, it's not the way to go. We should have never done it. Um, it. It was an experiment and it was wrong. And so now what we've got to do is take that key learning and figure out how do we drive that in to our future deployments. And this outside-in approach is how you do it, right? You get as much coverage as you can for as little amount of money and then you come in and do the expensive in-building only where you have to. So that's kind of where we're taking it. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Oh, it's got one in the back here. Yeah, just one question, just adding to what, uh, what you were just explaining. What, what are the key challenges um, you see vis-a-vis uh, -vis small cells compared to uh, DAS uh, when you are the big, deploying? The small cell versus DAS, uh, the, the, the biggest challenge right now is transport. Um, what kind of transport do we get to a small cell environment? Um, we have little pipes in DSL, we have huge pipes in Ethernet, and a lot of the small cells kind of fall in the middle. So what's the right transport mechanism? How do you get it there? Um, if it's outside of our footprint, what provider do we go get it with? Do they have fiber to that particular building? So transport tends to be the long pole in the tent for our small cell deployments right now. The other challenge is we need a single small cell box that can handle multiple technologies. Today, it's 3G, it's LTE, it's only AT&T, it's not available for AT&T plus the other carriers. We need to get to one box that can handle everything so that we aren't having to do multiple deployments because Again, neutral host is the way to go long term, and I don't want to have to build a network and then have Verizon Sprint T-Mobile come build one over the top, and then it costs them money. I'd rather it be neutral host so that when I build one, they can join it, it lessens my cost. When they build one, I can join it, it lessens my cost. So in the long run, that's the biggest challenge, is getting the equipment to support all the technologies in a single interface. 
Yes. Uh, among the uh, <clears throat> verticals that AT&T focuses on, are you seeing landlords more receptive or interested in it's, uh, DAS? Yeah, landlords are yes and no. Um, it, it's, it's an interesting dile uh, dilemma. Many of them are. Um, we're seeing a lot of uh, the verticals that are starting to see the benefits of good wireless service inside of their properties. Uh, I think in the hospitality sector, for example, we're really starting to build some real strong partnerships with the hospitality sector to, to get in there. Um, I think in hospitals, in medical, we're starting to see a lot of, of a synergy starting to develop between the carriers and, and, the, and the verticals. Don't necessarily see it yet in the sports venues. Um, they still think that they're worth a lot of money, that it's, uh, we should pay them for the privilege of deploying million dollar systems and in improving their infrastructure. So it's not always as beneficial there. But in the places that matter, commercial high-rise, hospitals, hotels, we're starting to see mutual benefit come back and forth. Still challenges in the really, really big ones. Uh, we still see challenges in convention centers, quite frankly. And a lot of that is due to competition. They're used to selling a lot of wired services, and those revenues are going away because people want to use their iPads and their phones instead. Well, when you do that, how do they make up for that revenue? Well, that's not my problem. I don't need to generate revenue for them. Um, as a LEC, I lose hundreds of thousands of access lines every year to wireless. I've got to deal with it, right? What do you do? You get innovative, you sell other services. And from a convention center perspective, I think that's something that they've got to focus on is if they're going to lose revenue there, they're going to. Whether I build a DAS there or not, people are not going to buy wired DSL circuits and wired T1s to, to power their booths anymore. They're just not going to do it. So they've got to get over that and, and come to a mutual agreement. Now, could they charge more rent if they have a better wireless network? I think they probably could. Um, I'm starting to see some convention centers lose business because they have terrible wireless service. And I think that's going to start to push that trend a little bit. But by vertical, some are good, some are bad. Uh, but overall, I think people are starting to see the benefit. We're really trying to push to get people to understand the true value. And I also think them starting to see the partnerships that are developing between the carriers, building neutral hosts, not building single carrier systems, that's taking away some of the risk. Because a lot of them were fearful of that because they didn't want to have a building that's only good for AT&T. They want a building that's good for everybody. And by going neutral host, that kind of obstacle is going away. So. Hi, uh, this is Ron Tisseri. Uh, I was just wondering, for an in-building neutral host system, what would be, a, I know each building is going to be different, what would be a general rule of thumb as far as a cost per square foot that you, you look at each different, I've read different things, I'm wondering, what you would think is yeah. a good general number. You know, it, it, it literally is all over the board. I really can't give a good answer to that because if you think about a building that was built, you know, back in, the, we just built 30 Rockefeller Center out. We had to core drill every floor. They charge us per square foot for the rent, just like if we were a tenant in the building, which is New York rates, right? Um, we had massive fiber runs. The head end, incidentally, is on the 58th floor of the building with a fabulous view over, over the park <laughs> because that was the only space they had, right? And so it created a unique challenge because we had to cable up to the head end and then down everywhere else. It, so every building is totally unique. Um, it's all over the board. You compare that to a brand new building, it's got fiber raceways, it's got cable pre-installed. You know, it, they're just all over. So, I mean, I really can't give a good answer, but you know, I've seen buildings under a dollar a square foot. I've seen buildings over $4 a square foot. A lot of it too, and a big factor is labor, is when you get into certain markets, what's the labor rates going to install these things? New York is astronomically high, and it's because of the labor rates there. The gear costs the same, the deployments cost the same, but the rent costs more, and uh, the labor costs more. So, you know, I've seen them under a buck, I've seen them over four. It just really depends on the building. And that's just for the DAS component. That's not inclusive of all of our BTS gear, because we track that separately, because that's unique to us. That's not part of the actual deployed system. So. Hi, Chad. Uh, this is uh, Nimish Advari with XNet Systems. Um, I got a quick question, and so you talked about high-rises, and uh, I wanted to understand your perspective as far as, uh, a, say, a Class A office building where AT&T may have five floors of customers, and then you've got Sprint and, and Verizon, and T-Mobile has various floors of customers as well. What is your perspective as far as neutral host for that? Well. Uh, we, we do actually do two different types of deployments at AT&T, so I want to, I've talked a lot about neutral hosts. This is the majority of what we do. Um, we do have deployments that we do, which we call ISC or in-building solutions, which are specific to a customer. So in that office environment, if the customer that was on our five floors came to us and said, I want you to enhance my coverage in my area, 
we might do a deployment just for them on just those five floors. And in that case, we wouldn't neutral host it because they're our customer record. We're doing it specifically at their request. And sometimes they pay for part of it. We do that some. Um, we're trying to get away from that wherever we can. But if I was approaching a Class A property and it wasn't because my customer come, had come to me and say, build these five floors and we're looking at the whole building, then we don't look at what AT&T's market share is in that building. What we're looking at is what is the building in total? What do I need to build to cover it? And even if Sprint or Verizon has customers on those other floors, chances are there's people with personal phones that are going to use us. And the market share on that building, other than the company provided devices, might look more like a normal deployment of, of the market in that particular building. You're also seeing a lot of companies that are starting to swift, shift to bring your own device. Bring your own phone, buy from whoever you want, and you're starting to see some of these buildings lose their single carrier philosophy. Not necessarily saying I like that or dislike that, but that's starting to happen. So when we go to a building, we don't look at what is AT&T's presence. We look at a building to say what is the total population of the building, how many people, how many floors, how many sectors, and we build it from that perspective. So we don't look at it that way. And quite frankly, when we look at a Class A property, usually the building owner is not letting us do that, right? They want to make sure that it covers everybody, that it's neutral host, and it's ready to go for everyone else that comes down in the future. So. Hi, Chad. I have a question. Okay. Ephraim from Gatronix. Uh, about the number of sites you're rolling out, uh, how many do you roll out per year in building DAS? And how many of it is MIMO? How much is it SISO? And is there a trend moving towards MIMO? And the sub-question of that, are you preparing your antenna system to be MIMO ready, even if you do the equipment only size or for cost reasons? OK. Um, I'm not going to talk about numbers, unfortunately. We're doing a lot. Um, I, I would say we're, uh, I'm confident in saying we're doing more than anybody else in the country. Um, we're building a lot. Um, the amount of money that I'm spending on DAS is, is ridiculous. But it's where the trend is going and what we need to do. So I'm not going to talk specific numbers. I think we've, you've seen public numbers that says we're going to do more than 1,000 over the next three years as part of Project VIP, um, more than 40,000 small cells. So the volumes are increasing every day. Um, so there's going to be a lot. Now, if you talk about MIMO versus SISO, really we're doing it from the perspective of looking at that particular property. You know, if I'm looking at a high-rise building, for example, that has 200 people per floor, there's a very dense Wi-Fi infrastructure, wire land is kind of the, the way that the building is configured. I'm going to look at doing the lower cost alternative in SISO because I don't need that lift that MIMO brings. Um, I'm going to sectorize it the way I need to and I'm going to get enough capacity to be able to get the traffic flow that I need, but I'm not going to bear that expense. Now if you flip that around and I'm doing an in-building solution, the same exact size building, but let's say that the people that work there work for Oracle or Facebook or Twitter or some company that's going to naturally be using their devices a lot more data intensively. Well, then I'm going to build it MIMO right off the bat because the nature of that customer is going to drive us to that. So we're really looking at how many people are in the building, what are they going to be doing with it, and do I need that extra throughput with it or not? And so that's what drives our decision to say, yes, we do it, no, we don't. We've done some buildings hybrid. We've done buildings where you, we've seen a, a commercial high-rise building and the bottom four or five floors might be a shopping mall and retail and you know, restaurants, but the upper portions are traditional you know, office space. We've done MIMO in the lower floors and SISO in the upper floors to account for the differentials. So we're trying to match cost to benefit in where it needs to be. As far as uh, planning ahead, not always. Um, we, you know, we, th we see the need for MIMO in the future. We're going to deploy at MIMO now. If we don't see the need, it, need for it, we're not going to. So, um, you know, it doesn't do you a whole lot of good to save the cost to cable for the antennas and put them up if you don't use them. If we're going to put them up, we're going to use them. So really the driver is from a labor perspective is, do I need it, yes or no? And if I don't need it and I don't see a need for it in the next three to five years, then I'm not going to do it. If I see a need for it in the next three to five years, we're going to do it right off the bat. So there's not a lot that we don't do it in. Um, it's typically sparsely populated building where the play is more coverage than capacity. It's almost all MIMO. I mean, there's a lot more MIMO than SISO. A lot more. Yes, today. And that's, as LTE comes out, it becomes more pervasive, right? I have a question. How okay. far out is your planning cycle now? I mean, when we're talking about the technology evolving and technology advances, what, what time frame are you 
is realistic. Yeah, we, we typically look at a three-year cycle right now. We're trying to look at a venue to say, what do I need to do to cover the venue for the next three years and not have to touch it again? Um, we've been a little challenged with that because as LTEs rolled out, we've got systems we built two years ago that don't have the 700 or AWS bands on them and we're having to go in and retrofit them. Um, the antennas might not be able to carry those frequencies. Um, so we've got some challenges with some of our older deployments. But going forward, we're looking at a three-year horizon. Go back to the Superdome example. We built that two years ago. For this year's Super Bowl, we didn't do anything to it. It was the same system that we had built three years ago or two years ago. So we didn't have to go in and touch it. Now, obviously, we did some optimization on it. We tested it, tuned it, did all those kinds of things. But we didn't come back and add any capacity to it. We did what we had. We, we, we danced with the date that brought us there, right? So that's what we're trying to do going forward, is making sure that we're there for what, uh, what we need um, going forward. So about three years. Anything further than that, your guess is as good as mine, right? Who knows what we'll be deploying there? You know, a good example is we picked up New Spectrum recently, right? So we, we've, that's not built into our DAS networks today. We're going to have to retrofit for that. So there, there's opportunity there. Any other questions? If not, please join me in thanking Chad for Thank uh, you very much. speaking with us. <laughs>